Welcome everyone to the hashtag Tuesdays with Team Counterfactual online seminar series in conservation impact evaluation and implementation science. I'm Paul Ferraro from Johns Hopkins University and today I'll be co-hosting today's seminar along with Rachel Martin from Conservation X Labs and Seb Costa Doat from Conservation International. Today is our ninth seminar in the seminar series. We've got a great seminar series. It's going to continue all uh, year long. Uh, we'll be taking a break in the summer, but every first Tuesday of the month, other than June through August, we'll be having a seminar series. If this is your first Tuesdays with Team Counterfactual seminar series, we start with the speaker, followed by a moderated Q&A session. For the moderated Q&A session, you can post your questions in the chat box. We encourage you to do it early and often. That helps Rachel and Seb uh, collate and curate and uh, bring together the questions in a way that we can deliver to our speakers. It's a very friendly environment. So if you're hesitant to put a question in, we encourage you to please do so. Uh, if you have a question, you're probably not the only one in the audience. So please uh, use that feature. If you find it helpful, you can activate the live transcription function in Zoom. You can find that under the menu ribbon under more and click on live transcript. The seminar will be recorded. So if you have to leave early or you know someone who couldn't be here but would be interested in the topic, you'll be able to watch it at uh, Society for Conservation Biology's Vimeo channel. We'll put that link in the chat box for folks. Uh, and if you want to engage with us on social media, please use hashtag Tuesdays with Team Counterfactual and tag at I Do Impact. At I Do Impact is the Twitter handle for SCB's Impact Evaluation Working Group. If you're not familiar with this working group, we encourage you to get more involved. You can find out more at the Conservation Society for Conservation Biology's website. You can follow us on Twitter uh, and you can sign up for the email list to find out when conference sessions and other uh, events that the working group is sponsoring. It's not a lot of emails uh, uh, so that you don't have to worry about your inbox being filled with them. All these links we put in the chat box. The last bullet, I want to make an appeal to all of you in the audience. If you are a Society for Conservation Biology member, whether you're a member of the working group or not, please help us reach official working group status. Right now we are a provisional working group for the society. Uh, and we need to have people essentially acknowledge or support our uh, bid to become a official working group. And you can do that just by clicking uh, on the link that we'll put in the chat box as Google Doc and putting your name on it. Yeah, there'll be no other obligations as a result of putting your name on it other than putting your support for Society for Conservation Biology to have this working group become official. All right, today we are lucky to have two speakers, Jennifer zabaleta cheek from South Dakota State University and Gabi Salasad from the University of Florida, who are going to talk about theory-based approaches to impact evaluation. It's our first uh, seminar on this topic, uh, and we're looking forward to hearing what they have to say. Both are experts in this domain. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Jennifer. Hi, good morning or afternoon, based on where you are. It's exciting to see so many people in the chat. Um, so I'm here today to talk to you a little bit about qualitative attribution methods for evaluation and conservation. The goals of my presentation are to make the case that qualitative methods can be useful in impact evaluation and that it is possible to establish causal inference in non-experimental settings, which I realize might be offensive to some people, but hear me out. And I also want to acknowledge that qualitative methods can be a lot more rigorous in their analysis, especially if you can provide evidence across a theory of change. And I also want to promote that we have a paper that has recently come out. I know it's going to be shared in the chat and emailed later. It's a bit of a how-to guide on qualitative methods. But for now, I kind of wanted to tell you a little bit about the story for how the paper started, some key takeaways, and then what's great is that one of the methods that we evaluated uh, was general elimination theory and Gabby Zalazar is going to be able to tell us a lot more about that in detail. So I always like to start with me, the person. Um, I am more than just an academic, or at least I, I hope to be, um, but I'm a sustainable development scholar. I did my dissertation work in India. 
I would be remiss not to mention that if any of you are looking for a really comprehensive data set on natural resource dependence and food security and income diversity in India, I have a data set for you and let, would love to be in touch. But that's not what we're here today to talk about. Um, but I do want to always clarify as a qualitative scientist or a social scientist, I want to note what my perspective is and how I see the situation. I use both quantitative and qualitative methods to solve real world problems. I think my most of my papers are technically quantitative, um, but during my postdoc, I had to do an impact evaluation where there was no quantitative data. We thought there'd be quantitative data, but it just didn't turn out that way. So the main research question that I was posed was, how can capacity development initiatives, so investments in people or institutions or organizations lead to long-term biodiversity outcomes? But then I was left with, well, how, how on earth am I supposed to be able to answer that? We don't even have any quantitative data to do an impact evaluation. So I'm gonna start or continue with, this is a formal, this is your formal invitation to maybe put aside some of the assumptions that you have about evaluation, especially as it pertains to having to have a counterfactual. Obviously it's in the name. I'm a little bit worried that I'm going into the lion's den, um, but I just wanna give you the invitation to think a little bit differently or to, to be open to some of the things that I'm gonna talk about today. So you're welcome. <laughs> so here's the problem. I think we already know a lot of this, but just to, to clarify, biodiversity is being rapidly lost for a variety of reasons, and there's only so Jennifer, much money. I just, want to, I just want to interrupt. You're not sharing any slides, is that correct? I just want to make no, sure. I am sharing oh, slides. No, so they're not on the screen. No. I thought maybe that was the trouble. I'm so sorry. Well, no I've, I've shared like seven slides. Well, well I think you I think that. you've demonstrated that you can one can be very clear without any slides. So that's well, thank that's you. So but I'm so glad you said something. Okay, this is like everybody's worst nightmare. Okay, here's my slide. I should have acknowledged what an opportunity to acknowledge my other co-authors, including Johanna Uckland, which you all might know already, Nicholas Merton, Jeremy Brooks, and Daniel Miller. I wrote my goals of the presentation. Basically, I just want to provide an opportunity for us to decide that maybe qualitative methods are not only useful in impact evaluation, but could be, if used appropriately or analyzed, could be pretty effective. This is me, the whole person. I'm a sustainable development scholar. <laughs> There's a lot more to me than just my research. I talked about my standpoint. This is your invitation to think differently. Because it's so important to me, let me say it again. Let's see how this goes. Um, and then here is the problem. We already know a lot of this. Biodiversity is being rapidly lost and conservation funds are severely limited. Moving on, so sorry. Um, so conservation agencies really wanna know, well, okay, if we're going to be investing in conservation, where do we get the biggest bang for our buck? What should we actually be investing in? This is becoming all the more popular, especially as private investors. So think, uh, you know, Jeff Bezos type that have lots of money, wanna start investing, how can they do it effectively? So the first thing that we did is we started with a theory of change. A theory of change is a way of demonstrating cause and effect through boxes and arrows, kind of highlights how you think an intervention will actually have an impact in the long run. But in a, um, academics always want to know, well, what actually works? And you all know very well that experimental design or randomized control trials are often the gold standard for impact evaluation. Um, because it's what's required to establish causal inference. But I will mention that randomized control trials, even if they are the gold standard, aren't always possible. They're not always possible because you might have really low sample size. It's sometimes hard to get a control group. So you can imagine if you're gonna do some sort of intervention on training for some park managers, intentionally excluding people from that opportunity might not be very ethical. Um, and a lot of people, especially practitioners, do not have the technical or coding skills to be able to execute uh, that sort of analysis effectively. And then sometimes the only data that's available is qualitative data. So we find ourselves in a situation where RCTs aren't always an option. So if not, what else can you do? 
And that is exactly the question that I asked myself during my postdoc, which of course is an academic. You start with a literature review. We spent a few months trying to figure this out with machine learning and it yielded nothing. So maybe we maybe with the use of chat GBT, things would have been different, but we ended up having to really scour the literature and basically just the literature and conservation. There are lots of other fields that have also looked at qualitative attribution methods, but we realized that if we were struggling with this problem, there are probably other people that also would benefit from some sort of how to guide, which is what this paper is. So I just wanna mention that a lot of times with case studies, they um, use qualitative interview data or focus group participant observation, and they're pretty effective at describing trends, but those can be biased. It can, it can be biased by the person that's talking about it and what they wanted to see. If they're looking for a phenomenon, they're more likely to see it. But there's always an opportunity to, to analyze this qualitative, qualitative data with a little bit more rigor, um, including establishing a theory of change to demonstrate cause and effect. So I just wanna say that these methods are not intended to replace randomized controlled trials, but they are absolutely uh, complementary to them or can be. And they're really particularly useful, not just when you wanna know if there's an effect or the size of that effect, but when you wanna understand how and under what circumstances or conditions that an intervention should be implemented, these sorts of methods are particularly important. So if you wanna kind of know the context and how and under what conditions, then these qualitative methods might be for you. And even though it seems that mixed methods seem to be very much in fashion, I get the impression that qualitative methods often get the short end of the stick. The fact that they're referred to as soft sciences, which really gives the impression that they're somehow weak or pudgy in some way, or they're just observational or hard to measure is a trope that a lot of people have. And I just want to acknowledge that's an assumption that we make, and there's a way to make them a little bit more um, rigorous. And I think the problem often comes with most of the time in the qualitative work that people do, they describe very detailed how they collected the data, how they found the themes, but they don't always talk about how they organize the themes or how themes are strung together, or braided together into an effective argument. So even though data analysis often inclu includes that coding and writing about themes or implementing grounded theory, there's a lot still left for how do you demonstrate or show effectively information or evidence across a causal chain or theory of change. So in this paper, we talk about a series of qualitative methods that aim to show if and how interventions are potentially effective, but they're often underutilized, especially in the fields of conservation. Not all of these methods are going to be able to establish or even aim to include or show causal inference, but um, relatively they're introduced in such a way where they're more rigorous to less rigorous, but we chose to include some of these less rigorous ways because they're in the literature and we wanted to be able to compare and let people know about them. So if you were to read the how-to guide, it gives a lot more detail on step-by-step -step processes, comparing these, giving you citations to the original text. Um, it would be absolutely ridiculous in 15 minutes for me to try and explain all five of them. But luckily, um, like I said, general elimination theory will be discussed in a lot more detail shortly. And what really happens in a lot of these or the way that we're able to establish causal inference is that they're able to share evidence along a theory of change. And a theory of change can be um, a series of boxes and arrows that shows things. It can be as dynamic as you see it within your own mental model. So sometimes people will have very different understandings of how different interventions will lead to different causes and effects. Um, that's fine, as long as you can defend the order that you do it, and then you provide evidence along each of the causal chain. Sometimes that evidence is quantitative, sometimes that evidence is qualitative, and qualitative, very broadly speaking, not just interviewing people, but also document analysis, um, can be used. So this is, these are um, methods for analyzing the data. They're not methods for collecting and reviewing data. So just those are slight subtle differences that are pretty, pretty important to recognize. So we 
my my biggest suggestion when using qualitative methods is to establish a theory of change because it leads to better evaluation the theory of change which is also recognized as terms like causal links or causal chains. There's quite a few euphemisms for theories of change. Whatever term you prefer is fine, but the idea is that you're trying to show, demonstrate all of the mechanisms through which you hope to see this longer term outcome. And the great thing about theory of change is that they're already required by a lot of uh, organizations in the planning stage. So before you're even allowed to take money, um, you're supposed to demonstrate how your intervention will have an effect. So this is an opportunity to use a tool that's already pretty common, but to not just use it at the beginning in the planning stage, but also later in evaluation. I will say that what often happens with theories of change and something for you all to be aware of is most of the time we collect analysis on very short term. We do the intervention, we might have data from before, data afterward, it's hard to track down people, so you immediately interview them right after you've done your intervention. But a lot of times what we're hoping in our theory of change actually takes a lot of time. So you might have some sort of knowledge intervention or educational one, but in order for that to change attitudes and then change later behavior, you need to be collecting data all the way across the causal chain. So there's lots of reasons as to why we only collect short-term data. I think a big time part of it is that a lot of us have master's students. So you've got two or three years and that's it. And it, let's be honest, it takes them a year to even figure out what's going on. And then by the time maybe the intervention was really supposed to have these medium scale impacts, they've graduated. We also know, and it's a big complaint from people in the field, that funding timelines are particularly short. A project that's five years is about as long as it gets, unless there's really exceptional circumstances. And then when we talk about long-term impacts, about behavior changes or changing cultural norms, this stuff takes sometimes generations because there's a lot of intergenerational change that has to happen. So it's not easy to do. Nobody said it was easy, but I just want to acknowledge that when we do this theory of change and we want to have evidence along it, so often we're focused at just the beginning phases, so don't fall into that potential trap. Um, so in conclusion, um, randomized control trials might not be the only way to demonstrate impact. They might be the best way to establish causal inference, but I would argue there are better ways. I think all of us have read qualitative work or case study based stuff that would be strengthened or be able to demonstrate causal inference better if it had a causal chain or a theory of chain and theory of change and evidence presented along it. So if you're wondering where to start, my suggestion would be start with your theory of change and sketch it out. Think of all the different pathways through which you might be able to get the outcome. And then that process will allow you and the evidence along it will allow you to eliminate certain explanations or strengthen them. Um, we have a paper that was recently accepted at Conservation Biology and we would love to share it. So as I said, I'm happy to share the paper. I think it's gonna be emailed out. I'm also happy to have conversations. And if anybody's interested in that big old data set from India, I also encourage you to email me. So it is with that that I'd like to turn it over to Gabby. Great. Wow, that was wonderful, a wonderful overview. Um, Jennifer, thanks so much for that. And thank you so much for having me this morning to talk a little bit more about qualitative impact evaluation. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and hopefully you can see a parrot. Um, so I am gonna talk a little bit more and dig in, as Jennifer said, to one of these specific uh, methods. And I'm gonna talk about a project I worked on for my master's degree um, uh, with Diogo Verissimo and Marina Mills. And um, it's called Parrots and People Evaluating the Long-Term Impacts of a Social Marketing Campaign for Conservation. And I think before I dig into this, you know, another reason we, we can really think about the value of qualitative impact evaluation methods is that oftentimes we don't have baseline data, right, for <laughs> um, conservation interventions. Like it's 30 years later, we know something went right, we're not sure what actually led to that, um, you know, increase in a population or positive outcome for conservation. 
And I'm sure if many of you are in the conservation, um, you know, evaluation field, you periodically get emails. I know I do that say, hey, we have this great thing. Could you help us evaluate it? And it's already taken place, right? It took place five years ago. It took place 20 years ago. And suddenly we have to scramble to think about how do we actually like find impact and prove impact, or at least, you know, get closer to proving impact when we don't have that baseline data. So I, before I jump into this case study, I just want to introduce the type of um, intervention we were evaluating. And that was a social marketing campaign for conservation um, that was run by the organization RARE. If you don't know RARE, check it out. It's an amazing organization. Um, and con conservation social marketing campaigns basically use marketing interventions to influence human behavior and conservation. And they use marketing for the greater social good. And we were interested in understanding whether or not conservation social marketing campaigns had long-term outcomes for conservation. So we chose a case study, um, a rare pride campaign that had taken place in 1998. So I did this research in like 2017, so it was about 20 years later. Um, and this campaign was um, to, to help create pride in the yellow-shouldered Amazon parrot on the island of Bonaire um, in the Caribbean. Um, the parrot had been impacted by poaching um, for the pet trade, and its population was very low at the time of the campaign, but um, I think it was around 400 individuals, and the population had increased over time, and we knew that because of long-term monitoring of the parrot population. And so we're looking, you know, 20 years later, and wow, this parrot population has increased. What happened? What led to that increase? This was the question. And specifically, to what extent had the campaign played a role in that increase? So we turned to general elimination methodology, um, which um, Jennifer mentioned. And the original kind of paper is Scriven 2018 or 2008. Um, but although it was a theory-driven qualitative method, there were not as many specifics on how to actually carry out the methodology. And so we had to work through kind of how do we actually apply this to this case study? And so the first thing we did was to identify a list of all possible causes for the increase in the um, parrot population. And the parrots are called loras locally. So we went through the literature, looked through newspaper articles from Bonaire, you know, um, and came up with a list of 29 potential, um, you know, uh, causes. And then we needed to look at the pathways, like what are the possible causal pathways that led to the increase in the parrot population? How did all these factors, these 29 factors interact potentially? And we basically came up with a giant theory of change, right? Here's, um, I haven't put all the detail in here because you couldn't read it anyway on a screen, but like we we have essentially said, there's probably from what we're, we're, we're hearing five kind of causal pathways and big interventions that have taken place that probably have could have led to the Laura population increasing changes in habitat and breeding, environmental laws, social marketing campaigns. That's our the one we were interested in, really. Environmental education in schools and ecotourism. So we came up with this big theory of change. And then the idea with general elimination methodology is to kind of cross out as many of these as possible um, through, a, through a process of, of, of research to come up with a theory of change that is supported by evidence, right? So we're kind of eliminating um, until we get to that theory of change we're confident in. So we had to test this theory. And we did this by, um, I conducted 33 semi-structured interviews with uh, individuals on Bonaire across eight stakeholder groups. And we chose the stakeholder groups very, what you know, purposively um, to get a diversity of perspectives. So we talked with veterinarians, biologists, tourism professionals, educators, government officials, media representatives, and local residents and conservationists. So not just people who were deeply involved in conservation and had a particular perspective or had been involved in the campaign, but people from a diverse range of perspectives. And we used two card exercises to test the theory of change. Um, so we gave them the 29 factors as well as blank cards, and they got to kind of you know, put them in piles. Do they think it has affected, this factor has affected the Laura population over the past 20 years? They're not sure about it, or it's not affected it. 
And then we also took those things that they said had affected the Laura population and had them put it on a scale of influence from most influence to least influence. I'm not going to go too deep into the methods here, but essentially we um, looked at overlap within and between stakeholder groups. And we found with a particular threshold um, of agreement that the stakeholders agreed generally that there were 12 factors that had positively influenced the Laura population over the last 20 years and six that had negatively influenced. And um, then we said, okay, this is what people say. What does the evidence actually say? So we dug into the literature to try to disprove as much as possible um, those factors, right? Could we find evidence that that's just kind of the story that we're telling ourselves? <laughs> it's not actually supported by the evidence, so we can eliminate it from further consideration. So for example, um, people said that these nest boxes had made a big difference, but we found a peer-reviewed paper that said that the nest boxes hadn't made a difference at all. So we eliminated that factor from the theory of change. And then we came up with all of this, you know, the qualitative data from the interviews where we did thematic analysis, um, the literature review, we were able to find a theory, we were able to take that big theory of change and reduce it down to this theory of change um, that shows you three causal pathways that have influenced the Laura population over the last 20 years. Um, we think that the Laura population increased because of decreases in poaching and local demand for pet Lauras, and that this can be attributed to a combination of environmental laws, the social marketing campaign, including the rare campaign, and environmental education in schools. So what this doesn't do, of course, is tell you we can attribute 30% of the population increase in Loras to environmental laws. Like we can't get that kind of data from this. But what we can say is what is the complexity um, of the pathways that have led to this increase in the Laura population over time. And we can say with confidence that, um, you know, based on the evidence that we found and the people that we've talked to and the review that we did, um, these three causal pathways were important. And just to give you an idea, here's a zoom in on one of those um, that kind of gives you the detail. Um, so social marketing campaigns, which is the one we were interested in, was, you know, were important because they led to cross-sector partnerships, and increased media coverage about the Laura. This increased awareness and it helped change social norms around keeping pet Lauras. And this led to a decreased demand, incentive to trade decreasing, decreased poaching, and ultimately more Lauras survived to adulthood and reproduced. And I think the nice thing about these methods as well is not only do we have this you know, theory of change, but we also have qualitative data Right, we have quotes from participants that kind of help tell the story. So here's one one participant or one interviewee said the primary most effective thing has been the perception that it's sort of an illegal activity, and that you know people who keep parrots as pets. They don't want to keep parrots as pets enough to break the law, and so this kind of sums up, you know, in a way what we saw <laughs> across that theory of change, and I think this is a real advantage of using qualitative methods as well is that, you know, I, I do think I'm, a, I also have a background as a journalist and a storyteller. And I do think that RCTs and, you know, quantitative methods are amazing in that they can give us these statistical results, but donors and foundations respond to head and heart and having quotes and stories that we can tell about causal pathways is also important. And I think, you know, having both a combination of these types of methods is really, really nice. And, this, um, and I know I've zipped through this and I encourage you, we'll put the paper, but um, we saw that it was an interaction between campaigns, law enforcement, and the increase in the Laura population. And I think we also showed that this is an effective and relatively a post hoc evaluation using theory and qualitative methods. Um, you know, I did this as a master's student, as one person, you know, with my advisors in just six months. And that's pretty incredible to be able to do that. That's a lot less expensive, obviously, than an RCT and requires a lot less resources. And I think importantly, it reveals underlying mechanisms. And that's something that, you know, these kind of quantitative evaluations 
often take place in a black box, right? We don't know, <laughs> like we don't know what happened in between. We know there was an increase, but we don't necessarily know these underlying mechanisms. And so if that's what you're interested in, I highly recommend um, jumping into these type of methods. And here's the paper. I know we'll put a link in the chat and I'm gonna stop sharing and then we can have a little discussion about this. So thank you. This is where Seb comes in. Is, is he still here? I can't see him. Rachel, can you see him? Um, yes, I see his icon. Okay. Were you also watching the, the questions or collating? Uh, yes, I do have some of the questions from the Why don't chat. You give a start and okay. uh, we'll wait for Seb to come back in. Thank you. Um, here's a general question, I think, either for Gabby or Jennifer. Do you have a sense of how funders view these different methods, both from maybe the quantitative and the qualitative side? And uh, what could your impression be that funders want more than qualitative assessments in this case? So... <laughs> I, you know, I don't work, I work with smaller foundations, I'll be honest. So maybe Jennifer can speak with, you know, to larger foundations. Um, but I find that uh, ultimately private donors to, to larger, to smaller foundations or um, tend to like this combination of qualitative and quantitative. Like, you know, I was working with a, a group recently and we were talking about setting up an evaluation and the fact that we could put all of this time and money into doing the evaluation. And ultimately what we might say, be able to say is that the intervention had a 7% increase in say environmental literacy for this group. And that's, that's really, we know as researchers, that's great, right? But it's not as impressive <laughs> necessarily to have just that small statistic um, for donors who don't understand statistics and foundations that don't understand statistics. So I think being able to show these kind of, you know, causal pathways and tell this broader story can be really important um, for donors who aren't working in the academic field. So that's that's something that I think about a lot is just having a combination. All right. So sorry, I'm back. My computer froze just at the end of Gabby's presentation. Um, but uh, thank you, Rachel. <laughs> and um, following up with um, an, another question, there is, um, I think you start answering that. And there is a lot of question about whether we can draw any conclusion about the effect of a project using only qualitative uh, approaches. I don't know if you want to um, to talk a little bit more about that. I can, I can start, but of course, Gabby, I'd love your feedback. I, you know, this is really an epistemological question. And it just depends on how you were trained and how you choose to see the world. There are lots of people that would say, especially in this room, I would suggest a lot of you are like, no, it has to have causal inference. And if we don't have a randomized control trial and are able to establish that, then is it really true? And I guess as someone who has also gone and talked to people and asking people, has it made an impact on you? And what has been that impact is also valid and truthful information. So I guess I happen to be a person that thinks that there's multiple realities or ways of interpreting the world. I will say that a lot of these methods that I suggested or that Gabby has used are really well situated in these smaller case study contexts. If we want to answer a bigger question like, does payment for ecosystem services really work though? And we need to do some sort of study that's global in nature, then these methods aren't so appropriate. But if so, just we have to think about, well, what's the research question? If we just want to know, is there an impact of the smaller intervention? There's lots of ways to measure it. I do think that it's super valid when you ask participants or people that were supposed to be impacted by that intervention, did you feel an impact that they are correct in whatever lived experience that they have had. But that doesn't mean that it's always appropriate or that we should only be using qualitative methods. I think in a lot of cases, these qualitative methods can be 
really appropriate, especially if it's a small case study, or are also really important to be complementary to be able to introduce the how and under what circumstances. And maybe there's an overall effect of the intervention, but it means something so much more to women than it did to men, or it meant so much more to the people that were living closer to the resource than those that were living away. So when we start to think about demographically who in the audience is impacted and what might be those variations, sure, you can try and look at it quantitatively. If those data aren't available, there's an opportunity to think about things in a little bit more of a subtle way. So yes, I think there are ways to come to conclusion about causal inference using qualitative methods, but it might not always be appropriate, especially given the scale at which you're doing the evaluation. Yeah, I, th I think that's absolutely right, Jennifer. And I think I, I agree. And I also think that um, it's fit for purpose, right? There's, there's, it, it gets down to what is your, it's, it's anytime we do scientific research, right? Really, like, what is your question? What are the best methods to answer that question? And so in, the, in some cases, qualitative is going to be more appropriate and it's going to be appropriate to maybe your budget, to your, <laughs> you know, the question you're trying to answer. Um, and it, I think if you're trying to answer how, qualitative is the way to go rather than just what happened, right? And so those are really important considerations as well. Thanks. And maybe a clarification uh, question to um, directed to Jen. Can you clarify that when you say RCT, you also include the range of quasi-experimental um, quantitative impact evaluation? Because I I lump them together. Yeah. Okay. So it's the ever <laughs> lot am for. Um, they're different tools in a toolkit, right? So this is an opportunity to broaden the toolkit more than it is trying to replace anything. So somebody just asked in the chat, like, well, how do you feel about systematic reviews? I feel great about systematic reviews. I think we need a little bit of everything. And as Gabby was saying, it depends on the research question and the context. I guess my the argument that I want to posit is qualitative evaluation or qualitative attribution methods are also useful. Great. And um, another question for both of you is how to encourage academics and practitioners to do higher quality theory based um, evaluation. I and mean, there is a lot of concern, you know, about associating qualitative with, um, I don't know, for some reason, <laughs> Uh, concerned about the quality and and more generally another question is is there a risk that theory based evaluation simply become a new umbrella term for making the status quo look more sophisticated so yeah i think that's a great question i mean i think that we we need to be diligent in the rigor we apply to qualitative data analysis we need more methods papers that help talk about how to be more rigorous in the way that we do thematic analysis. I mean, things like there are methods papers out there from other fields that we can draw on in conservation, like on intercoder reliability ratings to make sure that when we're doing thematic analysis of interviews or of data that we're seeing the same thing, you know, somebody, another coder or another person who isn't as deeply invested in the data is finding the same themes and seeing the same thing that we are. And um, I think we need to make sure as reviewers that we aren't just, you know, <laughs> saying, oh, this isn't rigorous, but how can we make it more rigorous? What are the methods that we can apply to ensure that, um, you know, we are, you know, interrogating the data in, in ways that um, don't have as much bias, perhaps, or um, uh, coming up with conclusions that are supported and that other people can see. There's all kinds of methods that can help us with this from anthropology, from sociology, from psychology. They're just not necessarily trickling directly into the conservation field. And so we need to look really actively for that. Okay, can you uh, dig a little bit further? People have very specific questions about for example, is there a way to account for factors who might not well, who might not be well supported, but are difficult to eliminate? Well, that might be a better question for you, Gabby, given 
the general elimination theory? Yeah, I think we need to acknowledge that we can't speak definitively on those factors. I mean, I, I, I don't know if you saw in those, um, in our theory of change, we had different kind of, <laughs> you know, shading for different um, factors where we found more or less support. And we could probably be even more specific in, you know, acknowledging the limitations of our knowledge on certain factors. Because yeah, if you're working, you know, there's not gonna be literature, right? On all of the factors that we're looking at in certain case studies, right? You're not gonna find, I mean, a peer reviewed study that's gonna tell you whether or not, um, <laughs> you know, this campaign or this specific intervention made a big difference. And so, yeah, I think I think we just need to be able to acknowledge those limitations. I do think that's something that's slightly unsatisfying with this, this type of analysis is that you cannot definitively say, or always definitively say, this is the effect that I've controlled for everything because you can't control for everything. We're attempting to do that. Um, so there is, and there's also a lot of times when you're using like process tracing is that there are many things that affect the outcome. And sometimes people are a little less, less happy when you say, well, it could be any one of these three things that's making a difference when they want to know, well, just tell me the one. So it, it does maybe, especially if you're looking for something that's super cut and dry, it will feel unsatisfying because that's not really what this is about. These types of approaches are more about what are the conditions, the how of it, and trying to understand the process more than it is, is there an outcome, yes or no? So just know that that's gonna be something that you'll have to contend with when using when using these approaches. Okay, so I think by now it will be clear that's. It's very about the complementarity between different ways of seeing processes and linking to outcomes. Um, so we have a lot of questions, Clary, about the clarification between um, this link and um, jumping probably a different type of questions. Uh, people ask, uh, what advice will you give to people designing at the beginning of large projects to be able to collect qualitative data to assess and understand the impact of that project? Any? Tips, recommendation? I think I, one recommendation that I would have when you start is that everybody has a different mental model or understanding of how the system works. So there's a lot of um, research that's been done to recognize and learn other people's mental models, especially because when you start to sketch things out on paper and then have conversations with people on your team, that's when you start to identify assumptions that you're making that other people might not be. Recognizing that the vocabulary that you're using might be a little bit different or misunderstanding of what vocabulary is. And we know what happens when you make assumptions. So my first piece of advice would be try and write down independently what you think the theory of change is within your team and have discussions about what that is. Then you'll be able to not just have one theory of change, but something that's a little bit more complex and just know that it's gonna start off a little bit messier before it gets more refined. But when you go through that process of identifying people's mental models and how they think theories of change might be different, then that gives you the opportunity to understand, well, what are the pieces of evidence that I would need to collect in order to prove or disprove my the causal mechanisms across that chain so that would be one place to start um, but i didn't quite catch if we're trying to figure out qualitative or my, my other suggestion too is that i always like to use the the sandwiched approach to qualitative quantitative qualitative so you go out and you interview so you start with your team you make sure your team's on the same page once you and it's often you need to have those international collaborators people in the field so it might be the team that got the money and then there's the people that you're consulting with so make sure you understand the team in very broad terms go and start to interview people and see if like this starts to kind of jive with what they think make certain adjustments then once you know that you've understood the problem because i think so often um, in general, as scientists, if we have a solution that worked in one context, our first idea is, I know it'll work in this one. And if we don't take the time to really understand the problem through those qualitative interviews and working with our in-field team members, 
we're going to totally misunderstand what the actual conclusion is. So starting with that qualitative, designing the survey in a very intentional way such that you'll have evidence across all of the different boxes and arrows in that theory of change, then doing it going back and asking people, hey, this is the effect that I saw. And a few people are writing about, well, what happens if one method, the quantitative shows you one answer and the qualitative shows you another? I think that's the exact reason that you need to go back and understand, oh, maybe you've misunderstood the audience. Maybe there's some sort of bifurcation that needs to happen across demographics and you need to redo your analysis. So I'm a big fan of getting your team on the same page especially when it comes to what is the theory of change and then using qualitative, quantitative, qualitative to confirm what you found in the field. Yeah, I really, really like that. And I like the idea of getting the same team on the same page. I mean, one thing, if you're, we're thinking from a practitioner perspective, you know, um, I think that the thing that I like to do is to start by saying, what are our evaluation questions, right? I mean, this is very simple, right? But what are our evaluation questions what data can we use to answer that evaluation question? Um, what are the indicators that would tell us that this, you know, intervention has led to a change? And then you can match once again those questions to the methods that you're going to use. And sometimes it's going to be very clear, right? Like this evaluation question is best answered by an interview, semi-structured interviews, or by tracking individuals over time. Whereas this evaluation question is going to be best answered by quantitative data and coming up with that plan from the outset and knowing what baseline data you need to collect, whether it's people's attitudes towards the project or, you know, data on, um, you know, uh, like a species that can really help you plan ahead. And then the other thing I would add is that, you know, when we're talking about impact evaluation, we're often talking about like, I, I think of it like summative evaluation, like what was the impact of this intervention? right? What happened? But I think of evaluation when I work with organizations as an adaptive process. Like we don't want to get to the end and then realize that what we did didn't work or had a, you know, <laughs> a less than desirable effect, which can happen with conservation interventions. So thinking about evaluation as adaptive, like having check-in points um, and qualitative can really help you with that as well. Is like having these conversations, um, having, you know, check-ins along the way, and then thinking about how we can change an intervention in the middle to make sure that it's actually having the impact we want to have. And so that's very different, but it's almost like formative evaluation. Um, and I think I would encourage you if you're at the beginning, like you have such an incredible opportunity to learn from evaluation um, now and in the process rather than just at the end. Fantastic. And they were specific, uh, I mean, not specific, but something very related to what, um, to, to, you, to your answers. Like, do you think, can you speak about the role of qualitative assessment to improve all we think about equity in conservation and development projects? Sorry, I'm not sure if we talk about equity in outcomes or equity through the process, but actually, um, I think through your answer, answer you, you could be able, to, I mean, the method could be able to address both, but I don't know if you want to reflect more on. I, I would like to reflect more because I there's a good point that was brought up. There is very. I have been saying, hey, there might people that are um, practitioners might not always have the technical coding skills to be able to do matching or some sort of other randomized control trial or difference in difference or execute some of these statistical methods. But just because those are technical and difficult to achieve does not mean that qualitative data collection is somehow easy and everyone can just like do it without training. I find myself in a natural resource management department where there are a lot of people that do fish and wildlife that have their students out interviewing and doing surveys and like nothing, it's so poorly done. So I don't mean to say or imply that just because it's qualitative, it's easy or not technical. It absolutely is. And in a lot of ways, because there are ways, so many ways to potentially bias data when collecting qualitative data, you might even need to be extra careful in the the rigor of the training that goes into how you collect the data. So there's there's some equity issues here in terms of quantitative skills that will probably never be achievable for a lot of practitioners, that that's like an automatic block for them. But I would say like the learning curve or the steepness of that curve between 
learning coding and learning how to interpret things in R and how to code is a heck of a lot steeper than learning how to do qualitative stuff. But that doesn't mean that just because you know how to talk to people and ask questions makes you a good interviewer. So I just want to clarify because I've maybe some assumptions that have been i did not mean to imply otherwise that this qualitative work isn't important but when it comes to equity and inclusion especially of our international practitioner colleagues this is an opportunity for them to start to engage but if we have a mindset especially as reviewers which gabby said originally where your instinct is this is qualitative therefore it's not going to have any sort of causal inference or validity and because it's qualitative, therefore it's bogus, is an assumption that I'm inviting everyone on the call to reflect on because there are more rigorous ways to show that there is a difference. So it's not exactly the same. It's fine if we want to say randomized control trials are still you know, the gold standard and best, but that doesn't mean that these qualitative methods are the ugly stepchild either. So I just wanted to clarify some of those assumptions that we might be making. Yeah, that's a great point, Jennifer. And it's something that I often talk with students about is like, they can't just run out and do interviews, right? They need to read the literature, they need to be grounded in the methods and the disciplines. In terms of um, the question of equity, I think that's and the uh, democratization of evaluation, I think that's such an interesting point and a, something that I'm jumping into a lot, which is less, you know, directly related to impact evaluation, but I want to throw that out there to the group is the kind of practice of culturally responsive and equitable evaluation. This is a really big kind of um, field within education, within development work. I haven't seen it referenced as much in the conservation world. Um, and so there's all kinds of practices that we can institute in all of our evaluations to be more culturally responsive in terms of engaging, um, you know, communities or our participants in the form formulation of, you know, the questions that we're asking in the way we're collecting data and recognizing that, you know, we need to make sure that um, the, the evaluation results were creating are useful both to us, to the foundations, but also to the participants that we're working with. And so it's more of a philosophy and framework, but I encourage everybody to dig into culturally responsive evaluation when you're thinking about conservation, because I think it can ultimately make um, any of our evaluations, whether they're RCTs or do using these theory-based methods, more equitable. Thanks so much, uh, Gabby and, and Jen for you. And super important point uh, earlier. So probably quickly for wrapping up the last question, I, I would like to get your thoughts about uh, the utility of theory-based approaches for extrapolation. You know, we always evaluate one context, but ultimately we are interested in, in predicting the impact of the similar intervention in a novel context. So can you say a few reflections, a few concluding thoughts? <laughs> I can say my thoughts and maybe Gabby would like to have the last word, which is um, context matters, obviously. Unfortunately, a lot of discussions end with context matters instead of explaining the way in which context matters. So that's a bigger uh, bone to pick with people. But <clears throat> because of the historical trends that have shaped the situation and the contextual factors that determine whether or not something is effective at that time given the social political economic even the whether or not there's recently been a natural disaster the context matters so very much that it would be inappropriate to assume that just because an intervention worked in this context it necessarily will we have reason to hope that it could there's uh maybe some proof of concept that this could work in a different place but this just goes back to how you understand problems and really emphasizing there's a quotation that's attributed to albert einstein and then i noticed in the footnotes it says asterisk we don't actually know if he said this but anyway allegedly he said if i had an hour to solve a problem i would spend 55 minutes trying to understand the problem and only five minutes trying to solve it when we say oh we want to extrapolate the solution to this what you're basically saying is i don't really need to think about those 55 minutes i'm just going to focus on the last five so i think there's something really important to recognize especially something that's really in the training of qualitative scientists or social scientists, policy scientists, is trying to understand 
in what ways does context matter that affects the solution when so often in these randomized control trials or matching they're trying to erase context <gasps> that might be a little a little provocative note to end on but i just want to say because context matters and the problem matters so very much i don't think it's always appropriate to extrapolate to other contexts gabby oh good this short so we want to make sure we end uh, on time go ahead gabby uh I'll uh, I'll leave it there with Jennifer, but I do think I, I do think context context matters, and extrapolation can be difficult. But the more we use these methods in different contexts, we, the more we can start to see hopefully patterns, right, of what works and what doesn't, and and we can use those to inform our conservation practice. So thank you so much. Well, thank you both for an excellent talk on a really important topic. Hours never enough for any of the topics that we do in these seminar series. But I want to thank both Jennifer and Gabby for being willing to present their knowledge and opinions with uh, everyone here. And thank my co-hosts, Rachel and, and Seb, for handling the Q&A chat. It was very active. Curating it was definitely challenging uh, to do. So we appreciate that. For those of you who are interested in continuing with the seminar series, we've got a, another great talk. Next month, first Tuesday, 2nd of May, Luke Sanford from Yale is going to be talking about machine learning for impact evaluation. This is a, another topic that I think a lot of people are interested in, but very few people have uh, the requisite knowledge. Uh, so I hope we'll see you all there and tell your friends uh, and have a good month, everyone. Bye-bye.